The search for extraterrestrial life started with the idea that we'd be most likely to find it around a sun-like G-type star. Our eyes began to look closely at Tau Ceti, and we imagined civilizations around systems as far away as the double sun system of Ceta Reticuli in the Aliens saga. We also figured out that possibly K dwarfs, those stars slightly less massive than the sun, may be even better, more stable and with longer lives, and more of them. Epsilon Eridani, Ptolemon, and the twin stars of 61 Cygni became amongst our best hopes for life. But the dwarves, it was long thought impossible for life to really take hold, as they were prone to solar flares, huge eruptions where they could engulf and strip a planet of its atmosphere in the blink of an eye. Red dwarves, the most populous group of stars in the galaxy, were unlikely candidates and practically useless, until now. Hi everyone, Vega here, and in today's video we're going to take a closer, more timely look at the type of stars that may prove to be the most habitable of all. So let's get to it. Leuton's star is a small red dwarf in the constellation of Canis Minor. Its timid frame and dimly lit system is dominated by the nearby F-class star of Procyon that shines day and night in its sky. It has planets, but it also has another secret. It's stable. It's a red dwarf star that's not prone to solar flares like most of its nearby neighbours. If we look at a table of the nearest red dwarf stars, we can see that there are around 24 within 13 light years of Earth. Red dwarfs, of course, are almost never visible with the unaided eye from Earth. Neither Proxima Centauri, the closest star to our Sun, nor the closest solitary star of Barnard's star, is anywhere near visual magnitude. Indeed, only the relatively large Lacale 8760, the last star on this list, is actually visible to the naked eye, and even then only under ideal viewing conditions. M dwarfs come in different shapes and sizes, and we should bear in mind that the size can have an influence on the stability of stars, and indeed if we can see them. So, let's go back to that list and take away the stars that are known to be volatile, and flare stars. That's to say, stars that we have observed having flares, or are aware of frequent solar flares. Our initial 24 stars are now reduced to a list of 7, and within these 7, the KL 9352, EZ Aquarii C, and indeed the more well-known Captain star, are still unknown elements and could also unfortunately have to be removed when more information is revealed. So, that leaves us with four red dwarf stars in our local area that are known to be non-flare or extremely limited flare stars. Lande 21185, Gliese 1061, Leuton star and Tea Garden star. If we look at the size of these stars, there does not appear to be much of a correlation, and indeed Landy 21185 is pushing the boundaries of becoming a more orange K dwarf, whereas the tiny Tea Garden star is barely even a star at all, with a mass of not even 10% of our sun. It's so dim that it emits just 1 1,400th the luminosity of our star. Tea Garden star has a very large proper motion, and is literally shooting across our skies. Indeed, only seven such stars with such large proper motions are currently known. The star is also thought to have two Earth-sized planets within its habitable zone, which makes it all the more fascinating. And don't forget to stay tuned to this channel to see more on these worlds at some point in the future. So again, looking at the list, at least four of 24 stars in our local area are potentially habitable. It's also fascinating to know that Leuton's star, Lalande 21185 and Gliese 1061, also have potentially habitable worlds within, or indeed at the limits of their habitable zones. It's commonly thought that Proxima Centauri will be the first system we visit, but if I were to make a bet, once we've studied these four systems more, we may change tact. Certainly in terms of human exploration, I'd say Lakyle 21185 is highly possible to be the first place we visit in the flesh, given that it's actually also approximating our solar system. We know the ubiquity of red dwarfs means ample opportunity for any possibility of habitability to be realised, but when that's wedded to the longevity thought of these stars, stable red dwarf stars like those four are likely to be the most commonly habitable places in the galaxy. Of course we should not forget that there are of course other major impediments to life developing in these systems. For example, it's less commonly mentioned, but intense tidal heating caused by the proximity of planets to their host star can mean temperatures rage off the scales. Extreme temperature differences also created by planets permanently facing the star with one face and the other perpetually turned away, combined with a lack of planetary axial tilt, is a known problem. But non-tidal factors normally thought to be problematic to the prospects of life in red dwarf systems, such as extreme stellar variation 
are of course mitigated within these special systems. There are of course other mitigating factors too that could improve potential for life also. Intense cloud formation on the star facing side of a tidally locked planet may reduce overall thermal flux and drastically reduce the equilibrium temperatures differences between the two sides of the planet. Super Earths, of course, may be more likely to hold onto their atmospheres, even in the face of low level solar flares. And there are expected to be tens of billions of super Earth planets in the habitable zones of red dwarf stars in the Milky Way. Also, finally, the sheer number of red dwarfs statistically increases the probability that there may exist habitable planets orbiting some of them. On our list was Captain Star, and as I mentioned before, we're not really sure if it's a flare star or not as things stand. But there is another possible advantage it's a halo star. Halo stars are distributed somewhat spherically around our galaxial core, but most of the members of the halo lie far above or beyond the galactic plane. With extremely highly elliptical galactic orbits, they can move as far away as 100,000 light years from the galactic centre, and as close by as a few thousand. Halo stars are thought to be amongst the galaxy's oldest, and at least mostly 10 billion years old or older. So again, perhaps move over Proxima Centauri and hello Captain star. If indeed it is proven to be flare free, life will have had eons to evolve on this wonderful star. The stellar evolution of a red dwarf is also thought to increase the temperature as it ages, although that said, there is little evidence yet of any blue dwarfs within our galaxy. What this means, though, is that the habitable zones of red dwarf stars will no doubt increase with age and become more wide and hospitable. It's also thought that red dwarfs are more likely to become stable as they age, so maybe there is hope for Proxima yet and it's indeed its furthest out planets. Red dwarf stars make up 85% of all stars in our galaxy. They're not the bright shining lights that attract our attention like Rigel, Deneb or Betelgeuse. Like a colony of ants to a human being, they are tiny, numerous and have a nasty sting in their tail, solar flares. But recent research has pointed in another direction, that at least some of these tiny little solar cousins are not so dangerous and indeed one sixth of them are like this in our local area. Let's hope the JWST directs its eyes towards these neighbourhood stars soon and we'll wait and see what secrets they reveal. Thanks for watching and consider subscribing if you haven't already. If you'd like to support the channel further you could consider buying me a coffee and I'll link this in the description. Thanks to those of you that have already done so. If you have any videos or subjects you'd like to see brought to life don't forget to let me know in the comments below and it could be your idea next week that shows up. Take really good care of yourselves, look after your friends and family well, and I'll see you on the next one.